Hi, welcome to Here to Them, hosted by Carolyn Takeda, former attorney, current small groups pastor, and life coach. Through monthly conversations with pastors, authors, and guests, we hope to stir your thoughts and encourage you to move from where you are to where you want to be, in your personal life, in your leadership, or in your ministry. Welcome to Group Talk. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carolyn Takeda, your host, and the small groups pastor at Calvary Community Church in Westlake Village, California. Well, one of the biggest growing trends in churches over the last 10 to 20 years probably has been the multi-site model. And a multi-site church is simply a church that's one church, but they meet in multiple locations. Um, And it actually started out uh, initially out of necessity because a church outgrew its meeting space. But then it like really took on and became a very popular, fast-growing model, and it's catching on all around the world. And in 2014, it was reported that there were 8,000 multi-site churches uh, just in the United States that had over 5 million congregants, um, which is a big chunk of the people here. And so this model initially looked like maybe would it last, but not last. Clearly, it's here to stay. And much has been written, discussed, and debated about these multi-site churches, the pros, the cons, what they're doing well or not. Um, And we will not be discussing any of that today. But instead, we're going to to focus on some unique challenges that multi-site models present for those working in small groups ministry. Um, and whether you lead from the central campus or one of the satellite campuses, and um, whether you have a really flexible model or a franchise model or whatever it is, um, there are some some tools that you can get uh, that help you manage that well uh, when it comes to groups ministry. And for those of us, um, like myself, who does not work in a multi-site environment, I want to encourage you not to turn off the podcast yet, because um, not only do I have a fantastic guest, but there's some relevant ministry principles to consider, um, even if you're not on a multi-site thing, just related to ministry and things for us to think through. And so this conversation may be useful for that, um, as well as maybe down the road, you guys have been toying around with the idea of setting up a second campus, and it'd be good to know what some of those pitfalls might be going forward. So um, stay tuned. And with me on the program today is Pastor Jason Williams, who is an expert on the multi-site church model. I just called you an expert, Jason, so you're going to have to come through. That's a lot of pressure, Carolyn. (laughs) I have no doubt you can meet it. Um, He has years of experience running small groups ministry in that context, um, and I really look forward to learning from him. So welcome, Jason, and thanks for being on the program. My pleasure, Carolyn. Thanks for having me, and and hello to everyone out there who's listening. Yeah, so Jason is a Texan born and bred. Um, and he has an MBA from the University of Texas at Dallas and has worked for 10 years in oil and gas and healthcare industry in the IT area. His degree is um, in computer science way back when. <laughs> um, and then he became part of the Chase Oaks Church staff in Plano, Texas for eight years as part of their executive team, their teaching team, and had responsibility for group ministry across all campuses. Um, and then he led one of the campuses, um, the primary one, and then also launched a third new campus. Um, At which point, I suppose, after a little while, then in the fall of 2016, Steve Gladen got his way and Jason joined the Saddleback staff (laughs) and has been serving almost a year now as the campus group's development pastor. Um, And of course, we know Saddleback has been doing multi-site for many years. I believe they started in 2010, so about seven years. Um, And Jason, how many satellite campuses do they have now? 18 currently, uh, 14 in, in SoCal, uh, four overseas, and, and we'll be launching the 19th on December 1st. So, yeah, that's, a lot of balls to juggle. That's a lot. And you are actively involved in leading and developing leaders and groups ministry in all 18 now up to be 19 campuses? This is true. Yes. So yes. That's why you are the expert. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That is a lot. It is. It's it's a ton of fun though. Great great uh, group of guys and and gals that we get to work with at all those campuses. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It means that you're very good at reading different cultural contexts, especially the international ones. So that you know what I'm getting, I'm getting better. Yeah, for sure. I made trips to to Berlin and to, to Hong Kong uh, last year, and this year I'm going to try to hit uh, Argentina and uh, the Philippines to visit those. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting better at reading cultural settings. We were just <laughs> saying um, off offline that um, he needs to convince Saddleback to plant a campus in Hawaii, so he and his wife can go and enjoy a vacation there. <laughs> My wife would take that trip with me in a heartbeat. I, yeah, I somehow some of the other ones, maybe not as much, but yeah. yes. <laughs> well, Jason, let's start off by clarifying what we mean by multi-site. Um, there's a variety of approaches, right? So how would you describe and kind of characterize them, maybe in some broad stroke, strokes for us? Yeah, no, for, for sure. I, I mean, I think when, when you're talking about multi-site, you, you've got two poles uh, to the conversation. You've got 
Yeah, one poll is kind of like high control, limited campus autonomy, more of like uh, the franchise model. And then on the other side of it, uh, the other the other extreme, the other poll is would be high campus autonomy. The campus is largely functioning as a as an independent organization with with limited central control. So, you, you I think you see churches fall on either of those poles, but but more commonly. People are somewhere on that continuum between them. There, there's a there's a lot of room in between, and, and some people are are sevens, some people are threes on that one to ten scale, just depending on on how they're coming down, on how much control they want to exert versus how much freedom and flexibility they want to give to the campuses. So, if we were to flesh that out, so say um, the more high control, so the franchise model you called it, yeah. that would be when you pipe in the um, a video teaching from the main yeah. campus. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and 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 the video teaching is an element, sure. Yeah, so I think you would control the teaching through a video element, but but then even all the systems, all of the the branding, all of the communications, uh, you know, that's going to fall in that continuum somewhere too. I mean, some churches they do the same video announcements at every one of their campuses, for wow. example. Okay. It's not just a message, but it's it's announcements. The flyer shell is the same. So yeah, there are multiple pieces to it, but certainly the the, the video teaching element is would be one of them. Okay, and then on the flip side, we on the other end of the flexibility. Um, each campus would be autonomous, have their own teaching pastor, have their own um, communications and centralized um, yeah. things. So yeah. if you translate like that churches- to groups groups ministry, what would it look like, say, on the one and the ten? Yeah, I think on the on the on the on the ten, if it's high control, then you're going to have uh, the same assimilation approach at every campus, regardless of its size. You're going to have all the same branding elements. You're going to have all the same marketing pieces. You're going to have the same displays in your connection areas. Everything. If you if you showed up at one campus and you showed up at another, the experience, you'd be like, wow, this is deja vu because it looks exactly like the other one I was at. Now, if you're on the one, the only thing that may be the same may be the, the overarching philosophy of, of groups ministry and maybe a, maybe a logo or something. And then everything else may be uh, much more diverse and, 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 and much more unique from campus to campus. I think that would be uh, kind of what you would see from a, from a low control kind of environment. And so for your experience personally, Jason, with um, Chase Oaks and with Saddleback, are both of those models tend to be on the heavier on the control side, or are, were they different? Yeah, you know, so I think there's a there's a, a fairly typical um, life cycle that that happens. I think when you launch campuses at the beginning, you're just trying to figure out how to make this thing. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what have we done? This, this right. Suddenly, I've got this level of complexity that, that I didn't anticipate, and I'm just, I just don't want this thing to crater. So let's get this thing done. So I think they start very uh, autonomous and entrepreneurial, and then over time, you see – you start to see like fractures in the in the model. I, we've talked about it, you and I. I think you can fake it for a while when you go from one campus to two, and you can kind of just keep doing the same things that you've always done, and that'll work for a while. But you'll start to see little hairline cracks mm-hmm. in what you're doing. And and when you launch that third campus, it's kind of a forcing mechanism. So I think then you start to get serious about systems. You start to get mm-hmm. serious about some of this, some some consistency, some alignment issues, and such. So I think they start more autonomous and more more entrepreneurial. But then out of necessity, over time, they trend to be higher control and a little bit more towards that franchise model. Is what what I've experienced in the two places that I've been in. You know that makes sense too, because if you're going to get bigger, um, you because you then do need structures right then right. why duplicate it you know why reinvent the wheel there's some economies of scale happening so then it makes more sense to use the resources of the main campus it's just better stewardship probably Absolutely. than to recreate it for every single campus so then i can see how it would drift towards that that makes sense right and, that, and that's what i always tell our guys it's like look hey guys there are a few things that we want to look at and maybe tighten up and get a little more consistent now that's not to squelch your creativity and and your your ability to dream and envision things but it is to let's be good stewards let's let's not be doing the same thing 19 times let's <laughs> let's not be writing the same emails or creating the same tchotchkes or doing this let's 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 be good stewards let's 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 build some teams of people who can help do this for all of the campuses and let's be a little bit more efficient in the way that we operate so yeah i, I agree with you wholeheartedly then what but what about can we push back on that for a little bit yeah. so then what about the cultural context though like if you make it so consistent like a franchise, right? So a McDonald's in, in China is exactly like a McDonald's here kind of right. idea. Then um, are you, what are you, might you be missing um, in terms of the specific context and culture and community where God's planted that particular next church? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think even in the highest control environments, you have to leave wiggle room for that. Otherwise, you're you're not going to get leaders at those campuses, and you need leaders at those campuses. So, so I think one of the one of the key elements to this conversation is is figuring out what what needs to be the same, and where are those mm-hmm. those areas of freedom, and and making sure that people at the campuses know very clearly where those areas of freedom are, so that they have those places to to innovate, they have those places to contextualize. To your point, because each campus is unique, and and so for for us at both Chase Oaks and at Saddleback. Those areas of freedom a lot have a lot to do with community engagement. I mean, how are we going to engage the community around us? We do very little other than say, "Hey, it's a need. Let's do this. Let's 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 make sure that we're actively engaging our community." And 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 what that looks like, we don't put a whole lot of parameters on that because that's a place where you've got to be able to contextualize. I think campuses, that, that from a size standpoint, and and their facilities. Some campuses can do these really awesome connection events and, and assimilation type things like the group links and other stuff. Some campuses can't. So they've got to be able to like flash and introduce the campuses small so they can say, hey, we've got these three three uh, people who are starting groups. They're out in the lobby in the connection area. Go by and say hi and, and ask them a little bit about about their group. But we can't do that at, at Lake Forest here. At, <laughs> but we can do that at Liso Viejo, which meets in a, at a high school and has about 400 people at it. So those areas, we got to define those clearly and then give them the, the opportunity to, to flex those creative and innovative muscles or else they, they'll, they'll get a little bit, a little bit tired of of, uh, of the role and feel like a caddy more than a than a leader. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, as you were talking, uh, Jason, I was thinking, you know, even a non multi site environment, just in a, a one church environment and one campus, um, we get that question a lot in terms of our small group leaders. If you have more than than two leaders, uh, you're going to have to know what parts to control. Um, and what really matters. So, for example, um, you know, that might be um, the requirements to be a leader. That has to be the same across the board. And it could be a low bar or high bar, whatever your church decides is a requirement. So that right. would be the same. However, how they meet, when they meet, um, you know, where they meet, how long they meet. I mean, all of those things are things you can flex with based on their schedule, um, who's in their group, how they do childcare. I mean, there's tons of space for um, them to figure out their context and to feel valued and supported from the leadership in doing so. But then yeah. we have to hold really tightly the stuff that matters to us, which is things like qualification for leadership. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I love what you said there, because I think when those things pop up and people innovate, I think in a high control environment, the tendency is to ask why questions. And I know you and I were just at a place where <laughs> somebody taught us, hey, replace why questions with what questions. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's important because as you've got campuses and as you've got people innovating and doing things, instead of asking them why, because it threatens the model and it threatens the control if you're on the, con- the high control side, to ask what, what was it that prompted them to do that? And then to celebrate that and seek to bring that in and, 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 Make that a part of the the innovation across all campuses that can be shared. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that and how to do that with with our guys here here at Saddlebag. Oh, that's cool. All right, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of this. Yeah. So, if okay. you have a satellite campus, um, what are what's the best way to go about building a group's ministry? Like, for example. Do you have to have a strong uh, main campus structure first, or can you start out and experiment um, with a, a smaller campus? Yeah, no. I, so I, I think it helps to have a strong main campus and to have that be a part of, of the DNA because you're not going to be dealing with, with headwinds at, at that True. campus. You're going to have them at your back and, and pushing you along. But I don't think that I don't think that's necessarily a deal breaker if you don't. I think if you are a passionate groups person and you find yourself at a, a campus that and you feel like you're kind of pushing things upstream, I think there is – I think you're a gift to that church for one, and I think I think there's a way to very graciously sort of lead up and out to to the primary campus. But I do think it helps. I mean, if you can begin with a, a clear mandate from that that uh, that main campus, and it's part of the DNA already. I mean, certainly uh, that that carries a lot of weight. So, would you recommend that? Um Okay, so say let's let's say you're in a, a church that values small groups and has a, a healthy and a um, established small groups ministry. So then you start off other campuses, campus three, campus four. Um, yeah. Then would your second or third hire be a small groups person, or would you prefer to have the campus pastor own the small group piece? Does it matter? 
That's a great question. Yeah, I think it is healthy at the beginning for a campus pastor to own groups, especially if you're a church uh, um, of groups, not a church with groups, because it, the only way that you're going to replicate that DNA is for the campus pastor not to see groups as something tangential to what they're doing, but as core and critical to the, the, the health and the vibrancy of that campus. So I actually love it. And we start here with without a, a groups person uh, because it, it forces a couple of things. One, it, it, it forces total ownership by that campus pastor of groups. But then it also starts them on the journey of building out a team of, of really committed and faithful groups people. So so they're looking, they're 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 leading groups, but they're at the from the very beginning looking for key volunteers and key leaders that they can pull in that even once you hire that person, end up serving as sort of a a part of a strategic team for groups at that campus that, that feels in a level of investment that maybe a typical coach or somebody might not because they've sort of run it on a volunteer basis in conjunction with the campus pastor. So I love the campus pastor beginning doing it. But then, yeah, our, our first hire after a an attendance trigger is hit is a group's person to, to step in because it quickly, if the campus is growing, groups are exploding and expanding. Mm-hmm. It becomes untenable pretty quickly. So the first attendance trigger for us is hiring a group's person that can give that some some more focused attention. What would be the numerical trigger for Saddleback? For Saddleback, it's 500. Okay. Yeah, 500 okay. attendees on the campus. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, okay, so the main campus, say, already has a group's um, pastor or a group's person. So then that person acts as a resource then for the campus pastor until they hit that trigger? Yes. So, so as you, you've touched on another question, which is sort of central team versus yes. versus the campus autonomy. So, the way the way it started for us both at at, at Chase Oaks and at Saddleback was the person at the, the first campus, the, the larger primary campus, sort of serves as a as a group's champion uh, across the first few campuses. They're functioning in a pseudo central role and and offering support to that campus pastor to the volunteer that they may bring into into that role. And then what happens over time as, as, as the number of campuses grows is that person in that pseudo role struggles, one, one because of bandwidth, but two, another pitfall of that approach is that that person is is deeply committed from and, and it dates back to before the, the the first campus was ever launched. They're right. deeply committed to that main campus, so they're always going uh, to be thinking through the grid of the large campus they've always been a part of, and it's a real struggle for that person to step up above that hmm. and to offer the kind of leadership that you need to to all the campuses, whether they're a campus of two or three hundred or a campus of, of twenty thousand. So, I, I think that that works again. That's one of those things. Things I think you could do the first campus or so, but then once you get beyond that, you start to see that be, become a major issue where you have to really start thinking, All right, I probably need somebody above all campuses in a central role to be able to think not through the lens of one campus out to the others, but, but even above that. And, and see all campuses equally to the extent and that that's they're... pretty much why you're at Saddleback. This is that's your, your role. That's exactly my role. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do, do you ever get? Okay, you can you can be honest here, but did you ever? Do you ever okay, get? I will. I'll just uh, Yes, we don't know if Steve ever listens to these. So here we are. Um, but do you ever get and kind of an us versus them mentality? Is that why you need someone that's kind of kind of float above all of that? Absolutely. If that person, that champion is connected to a campus, it's real easy to view them as as, as out of touch with what's happening at, at your campus. And and, 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 I, and man, I spend a lot of time thinking about that and trying to, to manage to that because it's an easy thing to set in. Um, I don't want ever our guys to think that I'm in an ivory tower and, and, and up on high pushing stuff out to them. I want to involve them in every conversation that I can. Anytime we're talking about strategic direction for groups, I want somebody, at least two people from regional campuses at that table. There'll be a group of people from Lake Forest for sure, but we've got to have people from the regional campuses there. Um, and, and just saw recently uh, a, a breakdown in this that, that causes some heartburn that it, I'll share with you. We were putting together this little kit that we were going to use at, at campuses, and as is often the case at Saddleback, it was something that came up kind of late in the game, the need for it. <laughs> And, uh, and we only had a limited amount of time to do it. And so a group from Lake Forest just gathered some people. They put this thing together and said, all right, here we go, handed it to the campuses. Mm-hmm. Well, campuses says, hey, wait, hold on a second. I've got to store this. I don't have any room to store this. 
oh wait, you want me to pay for it? And it's, it's, I think it was like nine or $10 a piece and we need wow. hundreds of them. I don't have that in my budget. Oh wait, I don't like this. And, and because, and some of the, the I don't like it, 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 it was, I, it was valid. I, I don't want to say it was invalid, but you could hear and listening to the person talk. The real issue was I wasn't involved in this conversation. Yes. So they don't feel valued. I was involved in this conversation and you're pushing this on me without any, any opportunity to speak into it. And we had to unwind that mm -hmm. and go back. So that's why everything we do when I'm in a meeting, if someone says, yeah, we're working on this. I'm like, Hey, is there, are there any regional guys in that conversation? We're talking about training hosts in a new way. Are there any regional guys helping you shape that? No. Well, here, let me, I'm going to walk out of here. I'm going to call a couple guys. When's your next meeting? Okay, great. Let's get, let's all of us mm -hmm. get together and talk about that. So I think that's a key thing that you, we got to constantly think about in, in order to keep that us versus them mentality from, from creeping in. It's a, it's a big one. It's a big deal. That's a great example. It seems like you probably spent a lot of time, Jason, in coaching and um, mediating between that too. Yeah, I, I do. I, I feel like that's a, a big part of my value is that I can, I, I, and they've told me, the regional guys have told me, Hey, I, I feel like instead of being given orders, I'm invited in to the, to the conversation. And for me, there's nothing that's more music to my ears than that. <laughs> because I, I passionately and, and fervently believe that, that we is way better than me. And it doesn't matter who the me is, the we, and I, and I tell the regional guys all the time, our church and the kingdom is better for your involvement, not just at your campus, mm -hmm. but for things we're doing across all of our campuses. And and so I, I try to facilitate those all the time. That's so wise. I, I think um, getting buy-in by having them have a seat at the table. Um, again, an application for that, even on one campus, is really saying, hey, we're doing this teaching series. What do you think about, you know, how we might do this with small groups or, you know, how can, and, and ask for it. And they just, people just feel so honored. They just want to um, be part of the conversation. It, they may not have, and, and it really does save a lot of heartburn later because yes. you're not dealing with resistance. It's it's a great moment in our monthly meetings when I, I I will spend I will very specifically and intentionally say hey I just want to real quick thank uh, Brandon and Jim for just this last week they they were in a meeting and helped us put this together because the reality is I can't get all nineteen to that table right but if those guys here one of our guys in this room exactly. Is at then they're like, okay, great. It's uh, we, we've had a voice, so yeah. And then and then those guys feel great because I've we've we've applauded them for their contribution to the overall strategy and movement of, of what's happening in the church. Right, and they feel heard by you. You're like their rep, so that helps. Yeah. Um, what are so that us versus them mentality, the needing to get ownership, um, buy in by valuing and inviting. What are some other dangers or pitfalls with the multi site groups ministry that's challenging? Communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the well, for one, I just think anyway. I think organizationally, and this is this dates back to my my corporate experience in our church. Almost every problem that we encounter in organizations of any kind is is a matter of communication. The, the more complex a, an organization gets, the more communication breakdowns you you can have. And so one of the things, I, the guys here, I've been here a year, and the guys say, man, I'm so glad you're here. You've, you've helped us so much, da, 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 da. And I'm like, gosh, I, it doesn't feel like I've done a whole lot. But but I step back from that and realize what I have done is, is dramatically increase the level of communication. The guys don't get surprised by things. And oh, I think that's, that's huge. <laughs> people do not like to be surprised. And they don't like somebody coming up to them at their campus and asking them about something they feel like they should know the answer to. And they, they feel like the only person who doesn't know that answer. So I think communication. We, we, we communicate. I communicate over and over and over again. And I do not think in a central role in a multi-site environment, I'm not sure it's possible to over communicate, quite honestly. So I think communication and, and then kind of related to that and, and the whole idea of, of the seat at the table, even from a meeting standpoint, I, I gather the regional guys are once a month. But I also go I have I make sure that someone, at least one, maybe two people from Lake Forest are at that meeting mm -hmm. because I don't again, I want us all at the table together, not the mothership pushing out <laughs> over here. So so we have those conversations. I sit in on any meeting related to groups that Lake Forest has to, 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 to keep that drift from happening to where mm -hmm. we kind of go back to the place where we're operating autonomously at Lake Forest and patting the regionals on the head out there mm -hmm. telling Hey, go go for it. So, so I think alignment, keeping keeping us together, keeping us in the conversation. I think there are all kinds of communication issues um, that arise that that we can't 
we can't communicate enough to, to overcome. Yeah, and if that's probably uh, your statement about everything kind of boiling down to communication in your organization, I think that's so true. Um, yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're a church of 100 or 10,000. It, it all boils down to individuals and yeah. their, whether they feel valued, whether um, you know, they are communicated with clearly and not surprised. Um, those, are, those are good ones. My, my wife's a counselor, and this is a random <laughs> sidebar, but she taught me years ago, hey, you got to stay in conversation long enough to get to the third or fourth level because the first mm-hmm. thing that someone tells you is never the issue. You have to communicate, ask questions to get down to what the, the real issue is. And that's where, like that one issue, they were complaining about certain aspects of the box, but you get down three layers and it's, hey, you didn't communicate with me and I wasn't, I wasn't heard and involved. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And what about um, if you were going to hire someone that mm. uh, would be in your, you know, campus three, four, et cetera, um, say you're ready, you've hit the, the numerical marker and you're ready to hire someone for a group's ministry, would you be looking for someone different than you would look for for the main campus? If you were looking for a small group's director or pastor on a main campus versus a satellite campus, would your cr- hiring criteria look different? Yes, absolutely. That's that's a great question. So I think who you're looking for, uh, whether you're one one campus and, and not multi-site, or, or whether you're um, multi-site and somewhere from one to twenty campuses or whatever that number is, I think it changes. I, I think at first, as you're you're forging the way and you need to to build a, a ministry model and strategy, you've got to have a strong entrepreneurial leader who gets marketing and gets leadership development and all those things. Um, if you're in a, in a very sort of, you're not a micromanaging culture, that's, that's who you need. As you, as your campuses start to grow, you get, you get more campuses, you start to maybe move more towards a a higher control model, or if you're just one campus and you're, you're just more of a high control uh, culture anyway, then I think what you, what you're going to need at that point is, is somebody who is more the, the shepherd and, and more of a, um, uh, someone who who is okay being administrative. They 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 they've got a model that's been largely fleshed out. Now it's just about executing. So so who it is that you need? That the entrepreneurs might get a little bit bored and a little bit antsy at that environment. Right. But but they're going to be excited about uh, maybe maybe starting the next campus or whatever. So paying attention to that I think is critical. And then as far as training, if you can touch upon training briefly, would you train differently in a, um Do you use your centralized training typically? across the campuses or do you let campuses develop their own training for small group leaders? So we, we do both. Um, and, and we try to equip the, the campuses to, to be ready to do that. And, and some of it depends on, on again, where that, that campus, uh, groups person is. So, um, we do do some all together trainings. I just did a strategic planning day last Thursday where we brought everybody together and I walked them through a process of clarifying the vision for their campus. And we talked. We talked about, hey, there's some given vision. There are things that right. come from, from Saddleback, from groups, the way we've always done them. But there are some uniquenesses to our campus that, that necessitate us um, – clarifying that vision on some level. So uh, they fleshed out their vision. We walked through developing a plan and, and ended with a plan. And I told them at the end, here's my goal. I've done this today. And I'd love to do it once a year. But I'd also love for you – at about the six month mark to lead your campus, your leaders, mm-hmm. your your strategic team through this as well. So it's it's about them owning the process of of, of building a plan and, and and training and developing people that, that we're we're coaching them on, but but I want them, I don't want them to just rely on me constantly. I want them to to get this and be able to do it and deliver it in their local context to make them the hero with their people. Oh, that's great. So you raise them up and send them out, and hopefully they're doing, they're doing the same in their environments. And then are they required to report back to you uh, how it's yeah. going? They are. So what we do, what we did this Thursday was we built these plans, and then we're having a, a report back day on, on uh, in three weeks. Mm-hmm. So we started the plans as part of the planning, and I said, hey, finish these up, flesh them out, let's get back together, and you're each going to have 10 to 15 minutes to share your plan. And that's, that's, that is partly accountability, but, but that's a small, tiny part. The real reason for that is I don't want to lose the best ideas from all, across all of mm-hmm. our campuses. Right. So I told them, keep the cement wet until you've heard everybody else's plan. And then once you do, steal their best ideas, incorporate them, <laughs> in yours, and then and then say, hey, this is what we're going with. So so yeah, so they they do it. There's a, an accountability piece, but there's also a sharing of collective wisdom that goes on as well. I love that. I think that the collective wisdom piece is one of the um, 
benefits of a multi-site model because you do have more people um, doing similar ministry, but doing it maybe in a different way that you can learn from. So it's kind of a built-in lab right there, which is great. Yes, yes. yes. All right. Well, Jason, uh, thank you so much for your time. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to share before we sign off? Oh, no. You know what? I, well, sure. Yeah. I, for one, I know we've talked about multi-site. And I know it's easy to hear like 19 campuses or whatever and feel like, gosh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, this, uh, my ministry's not the same or doesn't have the same impact. I grew up in churches of 200 or less. Mm-hmm. And 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 I, I, until Chase Oaks, I'd never been in one that was multi-site, and and I never, I, for I've never questioned the the value of my ministry in any one of those contexts. So I think whether you're trying to figure this out as one campus, a, a small church, or whether you're you're wrestling with this whole multi-site thing, I. I just love pastors. I love the, the the effort that people put in when we get to the lobbies and other other gatherings just to see and to hear and to learn from people. It's just so amazing what God is doing across the country and around the world. And and man, I just want to say to, to people who are listening, keep keep it up. Keep up the great God is doing some remarkable things around the world. And uh, yeah, just want to encourage them in that way. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Jason. So I hope I hope our audience does take that encouragement. What we do matters to the kingdom, matters to your church, and um, matters to our own selves, too, in our own development. So thank Absolutely. you for the work you're doing at Saddleback. Those guys are lucky to have you. We're blessed to have you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for having me today. It's, it's um, always fun to talk with you. Oh, um, you can follow Jason on Twitter at Jason N. Williams. Um, you can also interact with Jason on our Facebook group network page. If you have any questions to follow up, anything con- concrete, you can message him or um, find him there. And he's pretty active on that. He's also part of the Orange County Huddle uh, with Saddleback and others. So um, if you're in that part of the country, you can connect with him and he's making himself available so feel free take advantage of jason he has 19 please, campuses yeah. he's not that busy he's, <laughs> he's just hanging out <laughs> i will always make time so yeah please do if i can ever help <laughs> all right well thank you jason god bless you and your ministry you too thanks carolyn well thanks for listening to group talk if you like what you hear please leave us a positive rating on itunes and that helps other small group ministry point leaders find us and we'll see you next time god bless thank you for listening to here to there part of the group talk network of podcasts If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you want to learn more, make sure you check out smallgroupnetwork.com for more resources.